Welcome to the RICE Summit 2016, the fourth in the series. Uh, once again, we apologize for the slight delay in uh, starting the proceedings. Uh, we thank you all, first of all, for braving the Mumbai rains and the traffic. So thank you to, I mean, we're really happy to see such a large crowd uh, early in the morning. And a special thanks to all our outstation uh, visitors. Uh, we really uh, appreciate you taking the time out to be here in something which will probably be a significant two-day event in the, in the history of Mumbai and probably India. Uh, what we hope to achieve at the end of these two days probably could be quite significant for the social sector as well as for a whole spirit of collaboration and partnerships across sectors. So we look forward to the two days of uh, deliberations. And to tell you more about this and to welcome you formally, may I invite uh, Ms. Karen Shaiva, Chief Impact uh, Officer Idabro, to address the audience. Karen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Naresh just mentioned, uh, braving the rains at this time of the year in Bombay is not, uh, is not something that people anticipate. Uh, and therefore, I really, really thank you for making it. Uh, and this early in the morning too, right? We are not really an early crowd in Bombay, actually, uh, or Mumbai, as you would say. So uh, thank you so much for making the effort to be here. Um, I really want to uh, maybe welcome you with, with a thought, a thought that I would like us all to take with us, uh, because this conference, as people call it, but not us, is really about takeaways. It's really about making everyone think and think to take action so that we go with something to do at the end of these four days. We have two days here in Bombay, and then again, we kind of go to Pune, and we come again back to Mumbai. So across these four days, we want to make everyone uh, really think and ponder over multiple issues. And I will start with an issue that is very, very close to my mind. The first thing that people talk about when we talk about being in the social development sector is impact. It's a very contentious issue. I mean, people debate what is impact, you know? What, what do you really mean? How are you going to measure it? And business people will say, what difference does it make to us? And it is no con coincidence that today is World Peace Day. I constantly say this to people, and sometimes people stare right through me. Maybe some of you are doing that right now. But even so, I would like to say that, that for me, peace is the ultimate measure of impact of any social development activity. Because without peace, I don't think we can exist, whether it is at an individual level with peace of mind, or whether it is at a societal level in harmony with people who we live with in coexistence. And then, of course, the universe itself. Because nature and environment, if we cannot coexist, this is what we have, climate change. And therefore, for me, I think peace is the ultimate impact measure that we all need to worry about. And for those, I mean, this is something which evaluation practitioners would say, how would you measure it? So I'm, I, we can have that debate separately. But for the business folks who say, you know, how does this impact me? If you go to the un.org uh, site, it is said that the economic impact of violence has been in the region of $13.6 trillion dollars trillion dollars. Do, do, does anybody here know how many zeros that is? <laughs> yeah, it is mind boggling. It is absolutely mind boggling. And that's the direct impact of just economic, I mean, violence on, on the economic growth of the world. And therefore, it makes sense, right? The business case, as we talk about, exists right there. That if we can find that measure and make it integral to the work that we do, I think we have done a lot for our world and our planet. Uh, I just want to quickly also talk about a little bit about what RISE is about. As I said, people talk to us and tell us, oh, that's an unconference. And I always tell them, there are conferences, there are unconferences, and then there's RISE. We do things very differently because this is not just an event for us. It is an initiative. It is the culmination of all our work and the commencement of all our work for the rest of the year. 
it is through this platform that we hopefully bring people who believe in the same values that we do, the same ethical values, which transform themselves into economic value, an economic value which is a win-win proposition for all of us. And that is why when we, we ask our speakers to come here, and you will see as we go forward, they come here not just to speak, but to talk about the shared value that we are seeking to create in this, in this whole four days that we will take forward, as I said, as an action point of what we want to do. So I welcome you to Rice Summit 2016. I hope that you will find the peace that we all seek. And it is my fond belief that if we share these values, we will create shared value. Welcome once again to RISE 2016. Thank you. 16. Thank you. Thank you, Karan. And in true Indian tradition, uh, we'll mark the beginning of this uh, summit about the lighting of the lamp. And to light the lamp, uh, it's my privilege to call upon some very, very special people to us. Uh, we begin with uh, a representative of members who are central to our existence. May I please call upon Ms. Vanmala Jain of the Kupra Kabi Foundation to uh, kindly uh, come forward. Thank you. Along with her, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Neha Bhaktani from Tata Capital, representing the partners who help us create impact. Ms. Jain. Our student volunteers and interns are extremely important uh, for us because they will create the future for this country. May I uh, invite Viral Gala to please come up and uh, do the honors. Viral. Next, I would like to call upon a board member, a representative of board, a board member who's, who's extremely dear to us, whose guidance really steers us, Mr. Walter Vera. And finally, from the IDOBRO team itself, may I call upon Hema Ganachari to represent the IDOBRO team and light the lamp. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It is now my proud privilege to invite on stage Mr. Jayesh Ranjan, <clears throat> Secretary of State Telangana IT and Communications, to release the responsible value <clears throat> and, sorry, and also deliver the keynote address. Uh, Mr. Ranjan is deeply involved in sustainability and CSR initiatives in the state of Telangana. Uh, Mr. Ranjan, may I invite you on stage? And uh, could you please release the responsible value? We have an IDOPRO team member uh, accompany him, please. So, <laughs> Mr. Ranjan will now deliver the keynote address for the morning. Sure. That was very cool, by the way. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jayesh Ranjan, and. Uh, uh, let me first of all uh, tell you that I'm extremely delighted to be here. Karen and I attended a management program together a couple of years ago in Stockholm. And uh, since then, I've been really amazed by the kind of dynamism, the kind of uh, involvement she brings into the social development process. But uh, let me also mention that I'm uh, here not just because I attended this course with her. In my personal capacity, I participate, I engage myself with lots of this uh, social development work in Hyderabad. As I was introduced, I'm a member of the government in uh, Telangana in Hyderabad. And uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so, 
uh, I'm participating in uh, various kinds of uh, developmental initiatives in the city of Hyderabad. And uh, I also have a formal position now. Uh, our government, uh, in, in fact, we have emulated uh, the Maharashtra government. We have constituted a joint uh, working group in which, uh, in which the government representatives and the industry bodies come together to synergize and uh, improve their CSR activities uh, with the intention to make the outcomes more uh, impactful and better. So I chair that working group also. So I have both some kind of a informal uh, experience and formal authority to be called to deliver this uh, keynote. But uh, let me at the same time <coughs> mention that uh, in, the, in the kind of uh, personal engagement that I have with uh, social development work, I have uh, come across some uh, very, very uh, useful insights. Of course, these are all from Hyderabad context, but I feel that the context in Bombay or elsewhere, wherever you have come from, is not very dissimilar to that of Hyderabad. Uh, the first and uh, foremost observation is that there are still a large number of extremely vulnerable people who first of all need to be reached out to. And uh, all of us, be it in the NGO sector, be it in the corporate sector, and very, very obviously the government, we actually fail to do so. In fact, uh, uh, in my uh, journey of working with such people, I, I found, uh, at least in Hyderabad, five, six kinds of categories of such uh, people who live in extreme vulnerabilities. I would, uh, I would, I would just uh, lay out these categories. The first I would call are the homeless people, then street children, then uh, destitute, particularly the elderly destitute, people who are virtually towards the last phase of their lives, persons with uh, disabilities, and uh, people, uh, women who have been uh, who have been uh, victims of uh, trafficking. I, I'm, I'm sure that's a severe issue in uh, Bombay as well. Now, uh, if you need to really make a difference to these lives, the approach that we typically follow in the social development process, that needs to be changed quite significantly. For uh, various reasons, all these uh, people, people who are in these uh, vulnerable situations, vulnerable circumstances, their uh, trust on uh, outsiders, people who have good intentions, who can potentially help them, but who are uh, still outsiders, the trust deficit is very, very high. Uh, if, if, if I were to approach them as a representative of the government, the credibility in their eyes will be practically zero. In fact, the government's credibility in their eyes has been completely eroded. And there are good reasons to, for them to think that way. For example, if you look at homeless, because uh, Bombay has uh, hundreds and thousands of such homeless people. In Hyderabad too, it is a significant problem. See, most of you would be aware that uh, homelessness uh, in many cases is uh, is a matter of uh, extreme desperation. In fact, uh, in Hyderabad, the city is surrounded by hinterland, by rural areas, and many years, year after year, when there is agriculture distress, when there is not enough rainfall to support farming operations or cropping operations, people move into the cities. And uh, if someone is ch choosing to live on the footpath, on the streets, it is not that he cannot afford to pay some small rental for a room or for a space, but he chooses to do that so that he saves every little rupee and is able to send it back so that some more people are able to lead at least some kind of a marginally decent life. But at the same time, in the cities, we create so much of obstacles and uh, roadblocks for such people. In fact, in any neighborhood, the homeless people are the first ones who are uh, suspected if even a smallest uh, kind of uh, uh, some incident or some crime happens. And uh, for in the eyes of the police also, they are actually people who are outlaws who should be pushed out of the city as quickly as they can be. But uh, many of you will perhaps not be aware that they perform some very valuable functions for the survival of the city. In Hyderabad, for example, most of the homeless people, they do what is called in Hyderabad language, hamali work in the sense that they do this uh, loading and unloading. Lots of this uh, uh, food stuff, vegetables, etc., comes to the city from the rural areas and there are wholesale markets. So every morning you will find them uh, unloading that stuff. 
fortunately or unfortunately, our country, we don't have so much of uh, mechanization and automation. So you still need uh, manual labor to perform those kind of chores. And uh, many of them do that kind of work. And if you were to just uh, throw them out of the city on one fine day, you will find that you're, there's no one to deliver these fruits and vegetables and groceries and milk to your, uh, to your place. The city, the city will be crippled, so to say. But if you need to provide some interventions, some meaningful interventions to make a difference to the homeless people, for example, large, many cities, including Hyderabad, Delhi, etc., have tried out uh, creating night shelters for them so that at least they have a safe place to s spend their night, they have some place where their belongings can be kept, they get a, at least one nutritious meal every day, and so on and so forth. But there are e extreme uh, challenges in just creating a night shelter. In fact, large number of uh, communities do not want such a facility to exist in their backyard. The not in my backyard syndrome. They would prefer them to be anywhere else ex except in their backyards. Now, <clears throat> then, then again, if uh, if you have been able to motivate some someone to find some space to create a night shelter. Mobilizing the homeless into those night shelters is a matter of extreme difficulty. Because as I said, the trust deficit is very, very high. You cannot just go to them, walk up to them casually and tell them that I have a night shelter ready for you and just come and walk in and all that. There'll be an extreme degree of uh, mistrust in whatever you are suggesting. And uh, the answer to this is a very high, very intense kind of social mobilization. See, we notice in Hyderabad and elsewhere as well that uh, the intensity of this mobilization process, which is required to really capture the mind space of such people, people don't really value it, don't really appreciate it. It's just expected that if I just make 10 visits to some place and show my face every now and then, people will be enamored by me and they will just uh, follow blindly whatever I'm suggesting them to do. That really doesn't happen that way. The kind of intense uh, mobilization in uh, Hyderabad, for example, the NGO that I was supporting, we took a decision that if you really want to make a difference into the lives of the homeless, let our volunteers go and start uh, living with them. And they did so, not just for one day or two days or three nights or four nights, almost for weeks altogether in a, in a few localities, for months altogether, the volunteers actually lived with the homeless people, sharing the same life experiences which they would share. And eventually, they, the homeless also realize that here are some people who are sincere about what they are speaking. And thereafter, I, it, it happened very, very smoothly. They were able to, we were able to provide them uh, lots of other kinds of interventions. For example, many homeless people, they don't get a chance to take a bath every day. They don't uh, shave. They don't cut their hair. Uh, hair. So uh, these kind of basic, what we called as a basic needs campaign. So these basic needs were organized for them. Clothes were given, and then they were motivated to get into a night shelter. And now in Hyderabad, there are at least uh, five or six uh, night shelters, which are considered to be the best exemplars of how a community itself can manage uh, uh, a facility without really relying on anyone. And uh, incidentally, it, uh, uh, people who are on the streets, they, as I said, they aren't reasonably all right. It's not that uh, they are uh, on, the, on the verge of charity or anything. In fact, all of them pay for their stay in night shelter. Every night they are charged 25 rupees for a bed, 25 rupees for a hot, uh, nutritious meal. And, the, and their capacity and their willingness to pay is quite all right. So if you do this kind of a mobilization exercise and uh, you are able to, because see, if you look at their, uh, if you look at the minds, the way their minds operate, it's not that, uh, uh, I mean, 24 by seven, the very basic issues of survival dominate their thinking. So if you ask uh, the homeless person uh, what is going on in his mind, very, very basic fundamental things that, okay, today I went to this vegetable market. They told me that tomorrow onwards there is no work. Where will I find work? What is happening to my family back there? I have borrowed some money from that person. He is killing me to repay that money. Some very basic issues will be running through his minds all, all the time. And uh, if, if you need to capture some space in their minds, this kind of uh, very strong uh, bonding, very strong rapport needs to be built with them. And that ca can happen only if your uh, mobilization process is very, very intense. So the same is true for uh, any kind of vulnerable section. If you want to work with street children, as you know, cities like Hyderabad, Bombay, Delhi, 
they attract lots of migrant population in search of work many times uh, it is not just the man and the woman who come there they bring their entire family so while the man and the woman go for uh, go out for work their children are left loitering on the streets again it is a, a very very complicated process to mobilize them help them uh, find the uh, mainstream school where they can where their educational needs can be taken care of the same is true for uh, destitutes you might have seen in all big cities in our country there will be lots of beggars at the street junctions at the traffic junctions and so on and so forth there will be quite a few of them who will be practically at the last stage of their life you just need to give them a a kind of a dignified exit so that uh, the last few days or weeks or months are are uh, spent with dignity but again it requires a lot to mobilize them into into following whatever protocol or discipline that you are setting out for them so uh, whenever we talk about uh, social responsibility or the responsibility to give back there are uh, of course these are very good intentions but the fundamental point which i am trying to make is that if you want to convert these intentions into actions we need to think through that process it, it, i mean while your intentions are definitely very laudable and very noble how does that actually roll out into action is something which we need to collectively discuss and think about and uh, my personal uh, understanding is that nothing can replace a very intense social mobilization if you want to create a situation in which uh, you are only giving something from the top and there is nothing to receive it at the bottom you may continue to give but nothing will remain sustainable so before you start giving anything at the top ensure that a very strong receiving mechanism is created at the bottom and that can happen only by working in a very very close and personal and very intensive way so i'm very sure that uh, all the participants of this uh, on conference who represent uh, corporates who represent ngos and who are in the act of uh, engaging with uh, needy communities vulnerable communities take back uh, this thought and i'm sure many of you would have had uh, similar experiences also so let's uh, look forward to a very enriching uh, uh, rise uh, 2016 summit and uh, thank you very much karen for uh, for uh, inviting me here thank you uh, thank you so much uh, we now it is it is again an honor for me now to invite our next speaker mr ashish kumar chauhan the managing director and ceo of the bombay stock exchange the first stock exchange of asia mr chauhan has won numerous indian and international awards for his financial acumen and innovation may i ask mr chauhan to please come on stage and release the inclusive value Mr. Chauhan, may you please address us. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure and honor to be front, in front of you for, for the RICE uh, 2016. Um, uh, as uh, Mr. Jayesh Ranjan said, it's an important occasion. It's an important unconference. Un and today uh, is a great day to be uh, in this conference on uh, World Peace Day. So how much we need the peace to, uh, today in the world? I think uh, it's hugely important. And uh, it's a great day uh, to begin uh, this unconference. So why do we, uh, as humans, worry about this? Uh, many times, I think, uh, that all the inclusion, uh, and when, especially, I can see youngsters sitting uh, about, I mean, the e uh, economically sustainable or e eco-friendly framework, or why do we need uh, sort of le less discrimination and so on and so forth? And you keep on worrying most of the time uh, when we uh, speak at these conferences, we assume that everyone knows why this is required. But most of the time, we don't know. And the world is hugely dynamic. So uh, it's, it's important to kind of ponder over uh, what is happening, why the uh, world has not been able to eliminate poverty or discrimination and so on and so forth. For so many thousands of years, it has existed. And uh, how do we uh, basically get more? There is one. Uh, I come from the field of business and economics. So we always worry that uh, if you have less number of people participating, we need to get them to participate. And that is our selfish motive, saying uh, if 50% of the women don't participate, almost 25% of the country is not participating in the, uh, uh, in the job and so on and so forth. And so if you bring them in, 
there will be more growth and more prosperity and so on and so forth. That's a very uh, selfish way of lo looking at it. But the other way which humans look at it and which is in a sense uh, how we have been raised uh, as, as, a, as a society is the concept of uh, justice and balance. Every time, everything we do, we try to, uh, in our own mind, in a subconscious way, we try to figure out what is, whether it is justifiable or not, whether this is correct or not, right? We have that perspective. Whatever we buy, whatever we uh, interact with each other, even if we have brought some uh, sugar from the neighbor's house, next day what to give her itself is a justice, right? What is appropriate? What is balanced? And that balance seems to pervade in all our lives across all our activities. Um, and somewhere, uh, this sustainability, eco-friendliness, lack of discrimination, responsibility, all these things actually is a part of that single framework of justice. What is justice? And how do we create justice for everyone? Time immemorial, there is no justice, right? We, which we always tell ourselves that there is no justice. When a constable in Bandra gets hit by somebody and he dies, we think it's not justice. When a poor gets kicked in Bandra's footpath, uh, we think there is no justice, right? And so justice, balance, everything uh, is basically, and why I bring this concept of balance with, with justices, all of us also, especially people sitting here in air-conditioned rooms uh, and who can speak English or at least attempt to understand English, is that the balance is very important in our life in addition to justice. That the poor should come up only to an extent, not to my level. So that is the balance. That they have to maintain balance, they have to remain below me. And that is where basically the entire discrimination starts, uh, that every no discrimination should be there, no casteism should be there, nothing should be there. But only if I get admission in medicine. If I have got 89% and a scheduled caste person has got 75 and he has got into medicine, then it is injustice because it is not balanced. Although I might have gone to the tuition classes, I might have gone to quota, and that person may not have even pencil to work with, but still, it is injustice for me because it is not balanced. And so we continue as humans that what is peace, what is war, what is responsibility, it is basically about charity. That it is voluntary, and if I have some billion dollars, I might give a few hundred dollars and I should feel happy. It is a personal happiness which we are seeking in doing many of the things which we do. And for me, I just wanted to show the mirror to all of us that whatever we do, all I mean, somewhere I think there are very nice people, but very few people who actually go and do without this balance part, the justice. They seek justice and they work for justice, but most of us are very, very selfish and I included. So I just wanted to confess today that it is a part of life and we must understand that these are all human tendencies. Uh, we can continue to evolve all these things, but uh, finally, what are the larger problems uh, that we need to solve as a society today? There have been humongous number of problems, especially Indian society has been facing uh, for millenniums. And today, the largest issue, if we can resolve, we can resolve large portion of uh, everything which we today have gathered for is what I call unemployment. <laughs> In next 20 years, India needs to create 30 crore new jobs, 300 million new jobs. It is 30 times Sweden, which we cre need to create 30 times, not one time, but 30 times Sweden, uh, we need to create in next 20 years in our job market alone. We have more than 65% people below age 35, and the unemployment rate today is close to 10%. It is not the government's job alone to create jobs. Government, uh, we kind of look up to government, and India is not alone. In most rest, you know, most of the world, governments do even much more than what Indian government does in terms of providing social security, in terms of providing many other things, including health and so on and so forth. Indian government is not able to do it because we are a poor society. But if we cannot create an em employment for our people, youngsters, who are coming into the job market, one and a half crore Youngster every year, 15 million youngsters will be coming into job market every year for next 20 years. If you cannot do that, 
then the discrimination will increase, the exploitation will increase, vulnerabilities will increase, and also the frustration of the poor, frustration of the young can take away a lot of the gains we have actually achieved as a society in post-independence. Post-independence, India has been among the most successful societies in the world that has reduced poverty, that has reduced discrimination, that has reduced many, many of the ills that has been plaguing Hindu society and overall India for millenniums. And we should not be uh, losing out on what we have gained over the last 70 years just because we are not able to create employment. And today, because of the technology uh, and the way India is structured in a technological framework that even the poorest, even the remotest person wants to be technologically oriented. And technology is going to create wealth over the next 30 years. It is going to create more wealth than it has been created in the last 10,000 by human history. And next 30 years is India's for creating wealth. And if we can create that wealth, many of the ills which we see now are going to go away. And for me, I have a huge hope because Indian society today is hugely technologically oriented. And if we are able to take a large chunk of what is the, that wealth that is going to be created from robotics, from life sciences, uh, from space and um, 3D printing and so on and so forth, that Indian youth will create that wealth. Of course, that, uh, that youth will also not, not be so selfish that it will not share with the society. It will suddenly pay its taxes and also the bureaucrats and other people will also not be so selfish that they will only keep on taking it for themselves. Instead, they will also pass it on to the society. And that time, we will have a true society uh, which will be reasonably uh, having less discrimination, uh, less problems, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is something I want to tell you uh, about uh, why India is in such a great position today uh, in terms of uh, uh, taking a leap uh, in terms of reducing many of the inequalities, injustice that is happening. And by just becoming rich, if we become a rich society, whatever you see in terms of injustice, you will slowly start thinking that it's going to fade away. Uh, what BAC does, in this regard, uh, I mean, we are basically uh, the mother of capitalism, right? And it's supposed to be uh, really, really uh, on a cutthroat basis, that there is no mercy in our business. But uh, over the last few years, we have started uh, figuring out how do we remain relevant to the society. You can create huge wealth. You can have billions of dollars for the people who invest and so on and so forth. But if we are not being relevant to the society, we are not doing justice to our existence in the society. And for that, we have started working with women to uh, help them create newer businesses. There is an incubator in VSE which supports young businesses. But a part of that is allotted to specifically young women to become entrepreneurs and not only uh, uh, create their businesses, but also create jobs. But f because for us, Creation of jobs, that 15 million jobs, one and a half crore new jobs every year, is the most important objective for any state and for any country, especially India. And that's why creation of jobs is very important. And if women can become entrepreneurs and create more jobs instead of seeking jobs, uh, that's going to be very, very important. BSE also does a lot of training and certification. Almost 50,000 people are certified by BSE every year on working in financial markets. Uh, India requires huge number of people who can explain to others the need uh, for uh, taking insurance or taking mutual fund investments or uh, many, many things which they require to do in terms of their day-to-day -day life. And BSC does certification in that framework so that those people who take certification uh, end up uh, becoming uh, agents, um, insurance agents or mutual fund agents or bank employees. Uh, and uh, some of you might like to uh, come and take those certification training programs. Uh, on, by law, the government of India has uh, ensured that at least one woman is on the board of uh, companies listed on BSE. So uh, anytime, uh, I mean, every quarter we review uh, how many companies do not have uh, a woman on board, and we actually fine them. Of course, many of them don't pay fines, but someday we'll make them pay the fine. Uh, and uh, BSE also has a, a framework by which we uh, go and um, train self-help groups um, across the country, uh, especially women, and train them on the compounding. You, 
compounding of interest. I'm, many of you are aware of uh, the compounding concept, but uh, basically uh, compounding is a huge issue. Most of us don't understand that, especially women uh, who have uh, not been raised to uh, sort of do arithmetical calculations. Uh, and if we are able to sort of uh, explain to them the concept of microfinance, insurance, and so on and so forth. They'll make their lives better and also their children's lives better. And that's what we do across the country. We train uh, or we go to several self-help groups, especially in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, do that. We have a, a small and medium sector enterprises framework, which allows young businesses to come uh, raise funds uh, from third parties, that is, people like you and me, uh, and create more jobs. Uh, we also have created a, a, a new exchange for CSR called Samman. Uh, the new Companies Act 2013 um, allows uh, or actually wants each large company beyond a particular size to uh, spend 2% of their profits on corporate social responsibility activities. And government has specified those activities, what comes under CSR. Uh, and of course, uh, holding rock shows don't come under CSR. Uh, but uh, because many companies ask me that. Uh, and uh, what BSC has done is that uh, BSC has put in funds to uh, set up and operate a new exchange for CSR. So all the companies which need to spend money on CSR are listed. And all the, comp uh, all the NGOs which need mon money uh, on uh, this framework are also listed. And all their projects are listed. So whatever are the uh, progress that is happening on uh, the, those particular projects are available to the rest of the world. Several thousand NGOs have listed, and not surprisingly, no company has listed. <laughs> right? So, uh, but we are hopeful that uh, somewhere the companies will see the light uh, of uh, this framework, and uh, they will also come. Uh, we also support uh, Dalit Industrial Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we support almost all their programs across the country to promote uh, the Dalit businesses to uh, come and list on BSE, uh, and so that they create wealth. We create role models out of the community uh, so that they can also think that uh, they can also become uh, rich and the society is accepting uh, whatever uh, they are doing. Uh, we also support uh, widows. We work with uh, Lumba Foundation. Uh, Lord Lumba is a, a, a peer in uh, UK, and his life's mission is uh, to help widows. Uh, India has, it seems, uh, 40 million widows. And people uh, who are uh, dependent on widows, uh, put together with widows and uh, uh, people who are dependent, especially children, uh, are close to uh, 120 million. That is 12 crore out of 120 crore people. That is 10% of Indian population is extremely vulnerable just because uh, head of the family has expired. And that creates a huge problem. And we must understand that this issue itself uh, is so large. It's larger than, uh, I mean, the problem uh, is larger than uh, many countries put together. 12 crore is a very, very large number from world standards. Uh, I also work with an NGO called Land a Hand India. Uh, they uh, go out to the urban and rural uh, schools, uh, class 11, 12th, and uh, train uh, people uh, to uh, become, I mean, vocational training on welding, on motor repairing, and so on and so forth, and give them funds. Uh, to start their own businesses in case uh, those students want to start so that we create uh, entrepreneurs and not job seekers. So effectively, uh, at the BSc level, we have a framework uh, to create an inclusive society. Uh, and at individual level, of course, all of us try. But as I said, we are very selfish. And only uh, if the other guy doesn't go above me, that is, uh, so if we raise ourselves, uh, that itself is fine because even those people below us will rise themselves. And so thank you very much for calling me. I hope this was useful. Thank you, Mr. Chauhan, for actually, uh, as you said, showing us a mirror to our society and uh, the hypocrisy behind justice and balance. But also uh, for actually showing us the kind of uh, hope that we can have in technology uh, in creating a more inclusive uh, society and, of course, the wonderful work that BSE has started doing in terms of that. Uh, I move on now to our next speaker. Uh, he's very, very well known, in, uh, especially in the nonprofit circles. Uh, Mr. Puran Pandey, the Executive Director of United Nations Global Compact Network India. Uh, he's instrumental in bringing corporates and NGOs, NGOs together for social change, and he's done a lot of work in that. 
Uh, may I call upon Mr. Pandey to please come on stage and release the sustainable value. We can call upon Mr. Pandey to address us, please. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this very, very important uh, day. Uh, not that the RISE conference is happening, but we have several other excuses to be together. And as Karen rightly said, that we at the UN have been celebrating the World Peace Day today. And there are several heads of the states getting assembled in New York City. Uh, this General Assembly happening in New York is starting 21st where we will have a lot of fireworks, and you know what I'm referring to. Um, but uh, suffice to say that uh, today is a very historic day, very important day, very op epochal, in the sense that we have come together in the city of Mumbai, uh, in a college, which is St. Paul, uh, to deliberate and speak on a few issues and try and impress each other with the kind of thoughts and ideas and the values that we have. I would very uh, quickly like to say three things, and I would not really like to go beyond that because I believe if we could probably cover those three things, uh, ideally everything gets covered. Uh, I must talk to begin with about uh, the actors that we have in our society. And society does not only mean the place where you and I live. It doesn't really mean the country that we live in. I'm referring to a large community uh, where each one of us uh, cohabit to find our relevance and existence on the ground. And that should not really be the only thing, but the other things to follow are how much value we offer to each other, what are the kind of solutions that we have, how do we really help each other out, how do we partner with each other, and don't really confine everything up to the lip, lip service. I mean, that is what we have been doing for several, several years and decades. Uh, so I would only like to start by saying that in any democratic society, uh, we have three very, very important players, and these players are respectively the government, which is very, very important, the second part is uh, the corporate sector, uh, which is equally important, if not more than the government. And then we have community, which is equally, if not more important, uh, combining these two very, very uh, strong pillars of any democratic society. Uh, starting with the government, why do we really, despite we hate government, we don't want them to be the part of life many a times, we don't want to be regulated, uh, but we still need the government because of uh, certain values that they bring on the table. And those values are several, but I think two values are very, very essential. And these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating uh, laws and regulations and following it through. If that does not happen, then the rule of the law uh, will be broken and we will all run helter skelter and society would be more divided, more uh, worse uh, than what we have, and we will really find ourselves uh, into a very, very chaotic situation. So the relevance of the government in any democratic society, I'm not really referring to military regime or fragile regimes, but in any democratic society you need the government. But there are two things which are happening with the governments which are very sad, and let me say it in uh, following words. You will see, not only in India, but across the globe, that there has been a gradual withdrawal of the government from welfare activities, which means uh, that more and more private people are being subbed into the system and the government is withdrawing. And this is where you have a whole range of, a range of issues, CSR and stuff like that, uh, offer a part of uh, the, you know, the things to the businesses to do, find how much of money they have as a part of their net. Uh, net profit uh, and try and plow that into the system which really really means that the government is withdrawing slowly and gradually and the pace of the withdrawal of the government from welfare would be more heightened in a couple of years from now. So that is the reality number one with respect to the government and we should 
factor that in. Second part of the problem with the government, both here and abroad and elsewhere, is that many governments are trying to become uh, the recipient of the private capital, which is very dangerous. And if that continues to happen at the pace that we have or even gets heightened, uh, then uh, things are really going to be very, very difficult. And the third part is the government are broke. No government in the world, what's its name or what's its moral standing, has enough money to sustain itself. And that is reflected in several indicators and parameters, including a very, very steep fall on o ODA resources. And I can tell you, the UN budget in India used to be about a billion dollars until about a decade. It, it, it has come to about 300 million. So I'm just telling you, not showing you the mirror, but this is a reality of the times where governments will really need to find slightly more relevant place to operate and instill the confidence of what it does in the minds and the hearts of the people. So government part is very, very important. Now let's talk about the businesses. They're very, very important. And uh, they're important for a variety of reasons, but their importance is there for three reasons in particular. Uh, because of the capital that they bring, which is private capital, uh, which is very fine, especially when governments don't have money, resources are dwindling, and the only hope I can assure you of is the business. Uh, and we have to really recognize it. We can hate them. We may not really like them. We can do whatever. But private capital is very, very important because everything that you see from roads to bridges to everything else is being built with the private capital. There's a role for the government, but that role then becomes quite limited, but the private capital will have a lot of say in times to come. I was a part of a meeting in Addis Ababa in uh, June 2015 uh, before the SDGs were rolled out. And uh, one of the larger consultations which happened in Addis Ababa was that these 17 fold goals are very fine, but do you really imagine the kind of money that we will need to execute these goals and put everybody at par? You will not really believe, of course, it was inconclusive, uh, but that is still going on. For putting infrastructure, a loan globally will require about $80 trillion. You are talking about some $30 trillion and challenging people about counting zeros. I'm saying $80 trillion to put infrastructure globally to put everybody at pace and par with each other. Only to secure the water supplies world over, you will need $30 trillion. On reporting on SDGs, you will need about $5 trillion itself. So there's a huge money. Where will the money come in from? And it was again recognized in Addis Ababa that uh, private capital and businesses will bring a very large chunk of money to see that everything sort of happens. Not to say that they should be unbridled, they must be controlled and regulated and monitored. But the fact of the matter is that they will bring that capital and we will really need to live with it. And therefore their role in the society becomes equally important. They can't really keep on generating money, uh, being greedy, being merciless, but they have got to have a softer heart to whatever they have been doing. And therefore, businesses in times to come will be challenged more than what they have been challenged in the past for what they do with the capital that they generate for people, as Jays and Aussies were referring to who, who are on the you know, periphery, or those who don't have access to food, access to education, uh, access to health. I mean, those are the kind of things which are very, very critical and very, very essential. Now, the third part, which is equally, if not more important uh, than these two combined together, is civil society institutions and academic institutions are part of that. There are only three ways in which uh, uh, any entity can become a non-profit in context of India, which is trust, uh, society, and section 25, which is now section 8. And academic institutions are part of that, and therefore, St. Paul, 
as much as uh, any NGO is a part of the civil society institution and therefore they have a very, very big role to play. And nobody can ever risk their role away because of the fact that they are about four million, um, the reach is quite extensive, uh, they work with the people on ground, their acceptance is in certain areas more than the businesses and the governments put together. So the sheer reach and influence that they have on the people, they're very, very important. <clears throat> and I was also instrumental way back in 2006 to bring together ILO, John Hopkins, and uh, Planning Commission to try and figure out the kind of extent of contribution that civil society contributes to the GDP. This study, and I'll encourage all of you through satellite accounting process to refer that study and it's still available on Ministry of uh, Planning and Statistics and Planning Commission and John Hopkins and ILO. Volunteering and uh, nonprofit institutions way back in 2010 contributed to about 3.5% to the country's GDP, which is more or less uh, the same that agriculture and manufacturing contribute. So very, very important, therefore. So what do we really need to do if we have three uh, pillars, three very important uh, democratic institutions? What do we really need to do? We, not, we need to do three things very quickly. We need to identify that they talk to each other, not debate, but dialogue with each other. Debates will mean that you take your positions and not really going to lower your guard and listen to each other. So stop debating and begin to dialogue with each other. And I think many solutions can be found when you dialogue and listen to each other. Second thing that needs to happen is that each one of them need to factor in their contribution to the last mile, which is the last person on the street, on the ground, in the school, in the college, anywhere it is. And the third thing is that partnerships need to happen. Uh, businesses, governments, uh, civil society institutions, they can't really continue to do things in isolation. If you do that, you will not really be able to create impact and influence that uh, Saren was referring to in the morning. You really need to come together and try and multiply the influence and uh, create more impact. And I think that is the way forward. Uh, technology, the rest of the things will come a little later, but the one thing that can probably create an equalizer in our society could be education. And all of us, including most of you sitting in this hall, when you would have left your homes um, a couple of years back after doing your 10th or 10 plus 2, I think we all moved out, in, including me, with two things. One was the values that our parents gave to us in one pocket and hope and aspiration that education will unleash opportunities for us. And we left our homes 20, 25 years back, and we worked hard, and we have been where we really wanted, of course, in our own little way. But all that I can assure each one of you sitting in this hall is, please help support people by having equal access to education. And education is the only equalizer in our lives. Uh, whether you are from rural area or urban area or Jabalpur or Delhi or Mumbai or Noida, I think everything else in life will get settled. So wherever you are, educate your children, help people around you, if a maid comes in, try and encourage her to send her son or daughter to the school in the college. And I think that is the only hope. And India is doing pretty well in that. You go to any university in the West, you will find Indians, Japanese, and Koreans stealing the soul, and Chinese included there. I think the only hope to create equality, inclusiveness, and more sustainability for the society, for each one of us would be that we 
bring these partners together and see to it that out of the CSR, I mean, I was a part of the CSR provision which were created by the government, and there was no talk, I can assure you, in the first meeting that happened in the World Bank, and we had some people from consulting firms and some people from the government. There was never, ever any talk of making it either mandatory or semi-mandatory. And World Bank is very upset about it because government of India wrote on them and then did something which was never imagined. Wherever it is, whatever provisions you have into it, whatever areas you have in it, I think please choose one area that is education and try and build bridges with everybody and see to it that you train your people more in numbers than those who are going to require a job at the end of the year one or year two or year three. And that will lead us to several other questions, quality, credibility, integrity, what people learn, where they go, etc., etc. But I can assure you, education in its raw form and also in its most refined form is the only way out for us to create equity in society. And we will also need to see along with that is that how can education generate more value and income. Because ultimately, no matter what you create on the stock exchange, and if it doesn't really go in the hands of the people, you create more poor people on the ground than what you can imagine. I would really like to thank you, uh, Kevin. I would also like to thank each one of you for being here and giving me and all of us an opportunity to come and speak and express our thoughts, how so it might have been, but I think every thought makes uh, a difference and every thought is very, very critical. So thank you very much and I look forward to being in touch with each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pandey, for uh, throwing light on the new role that uh, uh, the, the private capital and civil society will have to play in, in the space of government really not uh, uh, concentrating on welfare as it used to, and also uh, talking about the role education will have to play as uh, the bedrock on which development and sustainability can be based on. And talking about education, it is uh, really, uh, it gives me special pleasure to invite our next uh, dignitary on stage, none other than Father Devasir, Director General, Society of St. Paul, who's a guiding force of this institution and also a torchbearer for the role that academia and media can play in social impact. May I invite Father Devas here to come on stage and release the eco-friendly value and then address us, please. I'm very happy to be here, though I was very hesitant to accept this invitation to speak over here. I was hesitant because I found myself incompetent to speak in this forum. At the introduction, it was said that I am the Director General of Society of St. Paul, all of activities and so on. At this moment, you find yourself in the Alberione Hall which is situated in St. Paul's media complex. And this media complex is a complex which is eco-friendly. And we try to maintain this complex eco-friendly, perhaps by keeping the dustbins in different places, by appointing different persons to make sure that the area is kept clean and so on. Now to enter into the topic, I want to call you to the first book of the Bible. The book of Genesis presents a story of creation. There we read, God created everything. God created light, waters, atmosphere, the plants, animals, and human beings. And at the end of the creation, God saw everything that God created 
and he said everything was very good it was not simply good everything was very good everything was valuable everything was beautiful and everything was in perfect order everything was in perfect harmony and then after the creation of human beings god said till it and care for it two small phrases till it and care for it that spoke about or that speaks about the responsibility of human being to till it that is to cultivate to produce to care for it that is to preserve it and not to exploit it and this is the way god envisaged humanity the whole of creation everything in perfect order and harmony and today we speak about ecology eco friendly atmosphere and so on why because we find this harmony is not kept up in fact last few decades we had been speaking about ecology recently um, the pope francis brought out a document called lauda to si where he speaks about the need to take care of the nature and when we speak about ecology we can find many crises starting with the pollution pollution of water the atmosphere noise pollution we can also find wastage india has become a place where there is lot of a garbage dumped every nook and corner has become a garbage then we can sp speak of the crisis of media now everybody is busy with media everybody is busy with um, social network even when we come to listen to a speaker most of us are with the mobile so much so that the wisdom that is spoken not that i speak wisdom the sp uh, the wisdom that is presented is not listened to again the crisis of media is that the relationship that something that is valued most in the past is no more a value today may it be in the uh, in the families may it be in the schools colleges wherever we are the relationship in reality we are all created to be in relationship with each other this is what god wanted for each one of us that we live as human beings in relationship with one another and due to the inven inventions of this mass media social media and so on the relationship was taken a back seat and we can speak of many other crises ecological imbalances and what are the reasons for this the first reason i would say is that we have become masters rather than administrators we consider everything as our property or my property we are not here as masters rather we are here as administrators to administer all that is given to us the gift that we have received the learnings that we have the responsibility that we assume of everything we are administrators we are not masters the moment we become masters we become exploiters and then there could be another reason perhaps a lack of awareness perhaps there could be another reason that is more we are becoming more and more selfish we look for personal interest we look for financial gain rather than that of common good so in this scenario as people who are trying to imbibe values today we speak about not only values but we are trying to become people of values who can spread those values so that we can create that harmony intended by the creator 
So for that, the first thing that we need to do is this, that we take a, we assume responsibility for the present situation of the world today. We have a certain bit of responsibility in the present situation. And we are also responsible for the extension of the situation. Unless we cooperate, unless we work in order to reduce, in order to bring in that harmony, we are, in fact, cooperating with the exploitation. We are cooperating in the creation of this atmosphere which is not supposed to exist. And therefore, accept the responsibility that is ours. And secondly, recognize the special responsibility, duty that is entrusted to us as human beings. We are human beings. We are unique with unique capacities. We know that. If we are created unique, we have also a unique responsibility to carry out. As I have quoted the Bible, we have the responsibility to till it and care for it. Each one of us has the responsibility to care for the earth, ecology. So consider the uniqueness of each human being, the unique gifts that we have received, unique talents, and make use of them to create a better world. Then begin to understand the interconnectedness of humanity. I said we are created beings to be in relationship with each other. So recognize the interconnectedness, that is, we cannot live or I cannot live without the other person. So when we recognize and accept that interconnectedness, I also will live accordingly. I will try to create an atmosphere where everyone can live a life of dignity. Then begin to respect life. Today, perhaps, human life is something that is not valued, at least from our part, as unique creation of God. Let's begin to respect life. Then through media, which is the most powerful instrument in our hand, create awareness. Then use everything in a responsible way. And another important element, Leadership, we are all leaders. Let our ability of this leadership or leadership quality be aimed at creating a society where everyone can live happily. And finally, as a priest, what I consider most important is that of a healthy spirituality. I have spoken about we have become masters and not administrators. Here, healthy spirituality means that we believe in a master. We believe in a God. If we do not believe in a God, what happens is that we become gods. Or the created things become gods. When we become gods or created things become God, what happens is that we become people who exploit others. The others become enemy to be subdued. On the contrary, when there is God, when there is creator, everyone becomes brother and sister. Everyone looks for the good of others. And therefore, living a healthy spirituality. Let us become good administrators of the world and thus create a world where everyone can live in harmony. Thank you. Thank you, Father Devas, here for reminding us of the spiritual responsibility <clears throat> sorry, that each one of us has to protect the environment and uh, actually live uh, this whole healthy spirituality aspect. Um, just to, uh, with your permission, I would also like to add that apart from the measures that Father uh, actually outlined, uh, St. Paul's also has a bimethanation plant installed in the premises which takes care of its wet waste. And over the two days, if you can find time, it will be great if you can actually have a look at it. Thank you so much, Father. And now we come to uh, the chief guest of uh, this morning. Uh, it's a small change, uh, uh, Ms. Ulrika Sundberg, uh, the Consul General of Sweden. Uh, she had to go back uh, to Sweden before she comes over formally to take over in uh, December. But we are <coughs> really fortunate to have with us Mr. Nils Ellison. 
Uh, the, he's the acting head of the Swedish Consulate General of Sweden in Mumbai. Uh, he's been a career diplomat uh, with the F Swedish Foreign Service for 40 years and has held numerous uh, positions in furtherance of his career focus on human rights issues as well as on conflict prevention and conflict resolution. Uh, Mr. Nils Eliasson. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today and uh, again apologies that uh, the new Consul General has not uh, been able to take up her post and therefore not be able to be here. But for me, having such a long experience in the Foreign Service is a privilege to be in her place. The previous speakers have uh, gone very deep into philosophical and societal issues, but my tasks are more limited, and that is to give several salutes and congratulations. And first of all, I thank and congratulate Karen for having organized this uh, event and for having been the driving force over the last uh, several years. Um, and for having created this organization. When I arrived in Bombay, Mumbai, and read about it, of course, it is only one word that summarizes it's impressive. I also salute uh, Drober itself for its aim to help women, micro enterprises, NGOs, and green producers gain access to organized markets using professional promotion and commercialization services. It's, I think, extremely important. And RISE, the word I was wondering about uh, when I heard about this event, responsible, inclusive, sustainable, eco-friendly, uh, summarizes many of the values which we human beings appreciate so much. I also salute the RICE partners. And I do so particularly to those, at least two in the audience here, who are previous uh, alumni members of the Swedish Institute Management programs in Sweden. I was very happy to, to learn about that. I know there are many, many more in India, and I hope over my three year, months here, I will get to, get to know them better and to interact with them. I think they are v extremely valuable in s promoting Swedish-Indian in relations. And I also salute one Swedish company, Sandvik, which is one of the partners and where several of you will go over the next uh, the day for, for, for a visit. They have in-depth, in, in in-field experience, as well as Termax, which is also one of the companies which will be, be visit. And they have a, a, a prime role concerning corporate social responsibility. The corporate social responsibility is a, a high profile issue in Sweden. There is um, extensive environmental protection focus, active uh, measures to respect human rights, and to improve work environments and fighting corruption among Swedish companies. And many of today's Swedish companies are at the forefront of integrating a sustainable approach to business in their strategies and daily management activities. And even me, as a diplomat, I have a colleague in the Swedish Foreign Ministry who is a corporate social responsibility ambassador with the purpose of promoting the awareness, raising awareness, and promoting the corporate social responsibilities around in, in her, her work. <coughs> the RISE Summit provides a fantastic platform, and I congratulate you very much, first of all, of having organized it, and, and having a series of seminars, roundtables, and talks about it. But there is one thing that struck me perhaps mostly when I saw the program, and that is um, one word which has become synonymous and quoted in many sources and many countries where I've served, which is Swedish origin. And that is the word fika. I was a little surprised when I saw that, because I've seen it also on another occasion during my, few, my, my three days in, in Bombay. 
Fika is, of course, a Swedish, very typical society, society activity in which you have uh, coffee or networking or some call it a Swedish high tea. And that was very comforting to me from a small country in a gigantic country like India that this is one of the Swedish words which have been incorporated into practical society. And I'm very, very honored and very pleased that that has taken place. Again, thank you very much for inviting me here today. All the very best of luck to your endeavors under, during the rest of the, 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 of the, of the week. And uh, I hope that when the new Consul General comes in December, she will be in touch with you and many of you to further Swedish-Indian cooperation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Listen, for those uh, wonderful words. Uh, may I also request you once again to kindly come on stage along with our other dignitaries, Mr. Ranjan, Mr. Chauhan, and Mr. Pandey, uh, to formally launch the RICE Summit uh, with the release of the souvenir. And uh, may I ask Karan also to join them on stage? Please. Father, would you come on, please? Shall we open it? Thank you very much. And finally, for the concluding remarks of this morning, uh, it's my privilege to invite on stage Dr. Achyuta Samanta, the founder of, of the Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences and KIIT University which is an initiative for social transformation through holistic education and a home for 25,000 tribal children. Mr. S Dr. Samantha, please. So good morning, everybody present here. All the esteemed speaker, guest, and the participants present here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this occasion. I am very much happy and honored to be with all of you. I am more happy and honored to write also the forward of this uh, souvenir. <clears throat> I am from Bhubaneswar, the capital city of Odisha. I have been working for the last 25 years for the social development in true sense. And I am very much happy to stand here this RISE Summit 2016, which means the responsible, inclusive, sustainable, eco-friendly and you will be happy to know that we have been working the, in two sense, the poverty alleviation, hunger alleviation, keeping an eye on the inclusive growth and sustainable development. We have set up one organization, as rightly told, that is the Kalinga Institute of Social Science Keys, a home for 25,000 308 poorest of the poor indigenous children, KG to PG, standard one to master's program, KG to PG, fully free and fully residential. You must have been surprised, you may not believe, if some of you must have seen just recently telecast the National Geography Channel, the Mega Kitchen. 
45 minutes. For one week they have been telecasting continuously and you can see the YouTube, the mega kitchen. You can easily understand. So I am from... Sorry. So I have been given five minutes. I should not kill much time. But you will be happy that whatever the objectives of this I have gone through this RISE summit in true sense we have been fulfilling all these things including the sustainable development objective goals. I am from Odisha state recently you must have been seen the viral the one tribal persons carrying his wife on his shoulders for 10 to 20 kilometers that is Dana Maji and the day it came out, the next day, I got admitted of his three daughters into this case. This is the activities we have been doing. You must have heard another one very sensational topic from one place, Nagoda, from Jajpur district of Odisha, where many children died out of malnutrition. Odisha is a place which is dominated by tribals, indigenous, 25% population. They are neglected, deprived, anything you can say. I have developed a strong passion to eradicate poverty through education, which is really permanent solutions. As our madam was speaking about the action, we have been doing actions. Our next speaker, IT secretary from Telangana, was speaking about the vulnerable groups they, they are really the vulnerable groups. We are bringing them to the main society at par with others in the society. Our other speakers also speaking the unemployment program. I have given a slogan to my 25,000 children in, the, in many uh, platforms. In India, half education is more harmful than no education in the coming days. You will see the students plugged in 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th standard. They will be more vulnerable, they will be more harmful to the society in the coming 10 years than the students or children without any education. That's why kids fulfills the objective. Once they join, they live with the higher education job in the <coughs> hands, KG to PG with the job. And you will be happy to know that so many laurels, it is not a question of just to throw some education to this poorest of the poor tribal children. It's a question of to bring them to the mainstream with all laurels. You will be happy to know the children from this organizations has reached up to the Olympics, Asia Commonwealth Games, South Asian Federation Games, UN has given special concert status, top 500 NGO of the world, top 10 in the country, Guinness Book of World Record, anything you can speak, uh, children attending UN Women's Summit in the Delhi, Ashoka Change Maker by the Ashoka Foundation. So it is a question of only opportunity given. If opportunity given, children from the lesser girls can excel like anything that we have proved from our action with this 20. And another last two lines. You must be curious because as there is no provision for showing the video clippings for one to two minutes, otherwise all I doubt should have been clear. So two lines I will conclude, you must have been doubts in your minds. How world's biggest fully free, fully residential institute for the tribals are running financially possible, feasible. You will be more surprised and happy to run this world's biggest fully free, fully residential institute for the tribals. I am not getting any funds from government or from any foundation from the globe. We have been running this world's biggest in a such a eco-friendly. KISS campus is totally eco-friendly. We have got energy certificate from the government of India, government of Odisha, as it is fully solar energy, biogas, STP, everything, everything, everything. We have been running this world's biggest fully free, fully residential institute for the tribals with the help of the entire stakeholder of one university I have founded, Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology, Keat University, one of the promising university with 27,000 students, professional course they're pursuing, including medical college attached with 2,000 bedded hospitals. And you will be surprised to know 
both the organizations I have started with only 100 US dollars, 5,000 rupees in my pocket when I was a lecturer at the age of 25 in Bhubaneswar. And my strong passion to eradicate poverty through education developed from my childhood. As I lost my father at the age of four and with seven brothers and sisters who the mother, we are not getting even one square meal in two days before 45 years in one remote village of Odisha state. So that has taught me and how poverty kills everything, what hunger does in the minds of someone. Because of that passion I have been with me from my childhood, I have been successful with the last comment by our father, it is God's creation. I am just the instrument to implement the things. How all these things are so successful, so nicely, so quickly, every visitor, there is not a single policy maker across the globe who has not visited and everybody agrees with the last comments of father. It is created by him. I am just the instrument. I will also invite you anytime coming to Bhuvneshwar. It is really worth seeing. And you can see the, in the YouTube National Geography Channel, Mega Kitchen of Kiss. So thank you very much once again, ma'am, for giving me such opportunity to have the concluding remarks. And we have been doing in true sense whatever objectives you have in the RISE Summit 2016. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Samadha. That was truly inspirational. And thank you for your passion and for actually giving the kiss of the future for the tribal kids in India.